We need to talk. This time, we're going to be talking about socialism. In the previous videos on this particular unit, we've been looking at liberalism and we've been looking at conservatism. And socialism is the, the third of the, the big three, the totally trinity of political ideas. And it's important, as with the previous ideologies, to think about the context, the historical context, to which socialism was born into. Because no ideology arrives like in a, on an island or um, you know, just, just kind of appears arbitrarily for no reason. Every ideology is a reaction to the problems of the, of the time. And so in this video, I'm going to be trying to explain to you the, the historical situation that led to the creation of socialism, uh, the core ideas of socialism, and a bit about its key thinker, Karl Marx. So let's begin. I'll flip us over to um, little, little, uh, little Mr. Cox. There, there, there he is. And it looks like it's got my guitar case just in the corner. So I'll pretend that's not there. Um, so socialism, why, why does it happen? Socialism happens as a result, I think, of liberalism. Uh, and what kind of comes before. Because if you go back before liberalism and the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution, you have this kind of social hierarchy that's built on class on the, on the basis of kind of inherited um, superiority. So think the old-fashioned feudal system, you know, king at the top, then you've got the barons, then you've got the knights, then you've got the peasants. And everyone is kind of born into your particular social role, and you're not going to be moving between these roles. But what liberalism does and the industrial revolution does is it breaks apart this set hierarchy and instead makes it all about money invention and power and factories at that time were horrific like in a modern day society we cannot really empathize with what they were like but in essence what you had was these factory owners who were massively wealthy and who used the factory workers to make these products. And the factories were often dangerous, as you're probably aware, children often had to kind of work there. There was no kind of health and safety laws, no sick pay, no holiday pay. Um, it was, they, they were dire. And if you're interested, you know, have a little Google and see what factories were like, or, or look at some of the factory injuries that kind of took place. Um, they were very dangerous, very noisy, very unpleasant, and the workers were often treated very, very harshly. Um, not always, of course. I'm sure there were some nice places to work. But by and large, by and large, the factory owners exploited and used the workers in their factories. And this is different to what comes before because under liberalism, you're supposed to have all this freedom. You know, everyone is supposed to be able to achieve and reach their fulfillment. Um, and and in under the ideas of rationalism, people are supposed to be able to kind of carve out their own destinies. But in reality, what capitalism creates under liberalism is just a new set of classes, except this time we have the factory owners and the factory workers rather than king, baron, and, uh, and peasants. And... So when socialist writers start to kind of look at the world, what they see is a world which should allow for freedom and happiness. Because liberalism is a very optimistic ideology when it talks about individualism, when it talks about rationality, when it talks about this idea of um, maximizing freedoms, negative freedoms, and so on. Um, liberalism should lead to a happier world, but at this time, and we're talking here the kind of like mid-1800s, late-1800s, early-1900s, liberalism is not leading to a happier world for the vast majority of people. It is leading to exploitation, it is leading to sadness, it is leading to misery. And therefore, Karl Marx and others start to formulate a new ideology which they call socialism, which in essence is an ideology which is written on behalf of the workers. It is a workers' ideology, which is interesting because it is the first ideology I think we've looked at that we can honestly say is not really for everyone. It is kind of aimed at a particular social class or the masses, if you like. You know, it is aimed at, at not the few, um, but the just the many. Um, and in, in is and is designed to revolutionise um, society. 
in short, and I'll be going into the kind of the key values of socialism, but in short, what socialism tries to do is to say that workers should own the means of production. And what I mean by that is, rather than all of the people working in the factory and then all of the money going to the, the factory owner and then just tiny, tiny bits of money going to the workers as part of their pay packets, the workers who do all the work should be co-owners of this factory and therefore everyone should benefit from what that factory produces and what that factory um, earns. So let's find out more about the core ideas of socialism. The first is the polar opposite to liberalism. Because whereas liberalism believes in individualism, I am responsible for me and I can put my own interests above other people's, socialism believes in collectivism. We are a community, we are um, responsible for one another, and the interests of the community outweigh the interests of myself. Um, and so that means everyone should be looking out for, for my benefit, um, as well as, you know, sorry, I, I phrased that badly. Everyone should be looking out for the benefit of, of the community as a whole. And so when I say myself, I mean, other people should be looking out for me and I should be looking out for them. Um, but it is all about the collective as a group, you know, and, and you can kind of think of like cheesy like episodes of Star Trek or um, if you think of kind of like alien species that are kind of like wired all in together. You know, it's all about the group. It's about the hub. It's about the the idea that, that human beings are, are individuals. Of course they are, but they, they, they are part of like... They are almost like workers in the beehive, if, if that kind of makes sense. You know, it, the, at the end of the day, it is the community and the, the, as a whole... Um, which is important and at the core of socialism, hence the word socialism, you know, social meaning to, you know, talk to others. It argues that there is a common humanity um, which we share with others and therefore we should cooperate with each other rather than compete against each other. Remember, the socialist writers are writing at a time when they're seeing what com competitive capitalism does to people's lives. And so they're seeing a situation whereby people are competing with each other, exploiting one another, and it's leading to hardship and struggles and literal, literally pain and suffering and death. And so instead they are arguing, why are we fighting against each other economically when we could be working together economically to support one another and to create um, a better world? And unlike modern liberals like John Rawls, who argue for an equality of opportunity, we should the, the idea that we should start from the same place and then we kind of go into a meritocracy, socialism is far keener that we end up with some sort of equality of outcome. Now, it is important to note here that Socialism is part of a, a, a rank, there, there are many types of socialism, and socialism is often seen as one stepping stone en route to communism. And so one of your questions here might be, well, does, is socialism arguing that everyone should be completely equal with the same amount of money, with the same house, with the same um, amount of possessions and things like that? And the answer is, Different socialists think different things, but in short, probably no, but in that it's bringing the, the equality of people far closer together as we head towards a more kind of communal society. Because Karl Marx, and we'll cover him in a minute, believes that so uh, socialism is, is on, on route to kind of communism. And in essence, it's kind of missing the point. If you kind of talk about, well, how much money do you have? What kind of house do you have? Um, how rich are you? You're kind of missing the point of socialism, which kind of takes this idea of what do you have away and actually comes back to this idea of collectivism as in what do we have and what has our community um, kind of put together. And you're probably, you're probably sitting there kind of with your notes kind of going, so is he saying that everyone has the same amount of money or not? I'm kind of deliberately sidestepping this kind of question because saying that socialism is just coming at it from a completely different point of view and it is going to try and bring together the idea that everyone has a similar standard of living but how it gets there in terms of money different thinkers think different things um, which we'll be exploring throughout um, this series of videos. Now that says chill class <laughs> move out the way I can't I'm gonna have to move myself using my 
Magical powers of levitation. Um, there you are. Social class. So, socialism has this idea of social class, social warfare, really, embedded at its core. Uh, Karl Marx called it the bourgeoisie versus the proletariat. And I apologize for my French um, pronunciation there, but he, he argues that this is socialism is in response to a class war where the lower, where the workers have been um, exploited. And therefore, now that the workers, there is more, there are more workers and they should rise up and they should fight for their rights. They should fight for what they deserve and that and that society should be reshaped by force um, to benefit um, the lower classes. Because ultimately, socialism argues that the workers should have control, or at the very least equal control, to pre what was previously seen as the, um, the, the kind of the upper classes. And one of the key values of the original socialism is what we call public ownership, or you might be more familiar familiar hearing it talked about as nationalization, which is kind of what Clement Attlee kind of referred to it by. But this is the idea that the, the factories under socialism, or what we might see as industry, is owned by the state, and therefore the workers are in effect co-owners of that particular factory, industry, business, well, this business is not necessarily the word, but but think about think about the NHS. Every we all own the NHS. If you live in the in the United Kingdom, we all pay and pay with our taxes to fund it, and then the NHS exists to to serve us as a as a people, and the people that work for the NHS. Um, Obviously, earn money, but they also know in the NHS that the they are not, they are earning money, which is a fair wage um, for what they are doing, and they are not being exploited by some fat cat rich factory owner who owns the entire NHS who is sitting there kind of making millions. You know, it, it is a um, a collectively funded, collectively produced. Um, socialist idea and I, and I've heard Britain occasionally described as a socialist country purely because we have an NHS now I'm not saying NHS is the perfect model of a socialist um, factory and some of you might be kind of thinking they're going to go oh, well it's not it's not quite the socialist model fine but you but if you just get the general principles that the you know you understand that the NHS is funded by taxes you understand that the NHS is owned by the government rather than by um, Alan Sugar Richard Branson or a famous businessman or e Elon Musk or whatever like that you know that kind of gives you this kind of idea of what a socialist kind of version of it might be. And if you know your kind of Clement Attlee history, 1945, you'll know that he nationalized or brought into public ownership the energy companies, the transport companies, the NHS, uh, I think the postal services, and, and, and other things as well because of his socialist values believing in um, public ownership. Now, this last one depends on which type of socialist you are and where you're living in the world and, and things like that. But socialists also often believe in a strong nation state or the idea that this community which you are a part of is part has a national identity. And this can be most commonly seen in that many socialists were initially opposed for many, many years to the European Union because they saw that their socialism was based around their countries, whether it was the United Kingdom, whether it was Russia, whether it was China, whether it was Cuba, there was a national identity to their socialism because socialism only works if everyone feels that they belong to this particular community. Collectivism, common humanity, equality of outcome, workers' control. You know, it has to be a group which believes in the benefit of everyone else in that group. Um, and so for many socialists, that then gets tied into this idea of national identity. You know, we have at our at our core, we have a core national identity, and therefore collectively we are going to create this kind of public ownership and, and so on. Um, and so for many, but not all, socialists, there is a an idea of a thread of nationalism that often kind of runs through um, their 
their socialism. But there are different types of socialists, just like there are different types of um, conservative. And what's interesting in looking around Europe as a whole, because socialism uh, um, initially was kind of a very much a European ideology, um, is how different socialists kind of um, approach this idea of, an, of a nation state. Now, just to give you, before I move on to Karl Marx, just, just, just to expand that idea of different socialists across the world. I said in the introduction, ideologies are a reaction to what is happening. And the Industrial Revolution very much started in Europe, in particular the United Kingdom, but also going kind of across um, in, into kind of Eastern Europe. And it, it was in the places where the exploitation of workers was at its worst that the call for socialism and the socialist revolutions was at its strongest. And where you can see a key difference is when you go over to America. Because America, in some ways, kind of sidestepped some of the worst aspects of the Industrial Revolution because they had, they had slavery, which in many ways is, is worse. Um, but in America, you never had this idea that, oh, I'm free, and yet I'm still kind of forced to be in this factory and actually my life is hell. In America, you actually had slavery. And so there was never the, you know, I'm not free. It was almost like, I mean, slavery in a way is a bit like the old feudal system. You know, you're born into a, into a certain role and there's nothing you can do about it. And so the point I'm trying to make here, probably quite badly, is that in America, the calls for socialism has never been as strong because there's never been this kind of breakdown of liberalism uh, in, for the working classes in the same way. And to this day... America as a whole is more to the right than West, than um, many areas of of Europe, and so when you see socialism in America, it tends to be a very much more of kind of a di diluted form. I mean, if you think about where the communist revolutions have kind of taken place in the world, it's European and then going east, and the only exception to that being famously Cuba, um, which America was very very upset about because they never ever saw the need. Um, for socialism. And so words like socialism are far more looked down on in America um, than in the rest of Europe. And the word socialism as well is a very emotionally loaded word. Where, where is the word liberal and liberalism has its definitions, but it's often used kind of as a complementary word. Socialism has got a lot of historical baggage attached to it, and so is often used in a negative um, kind of context. Now, I, in this uh, introduction video, I've almost been going 20 minutes, so I, I don't want to um, spend um, too long here. In fact, no, I think I will, actually. I will, I'll, what I'll do is I'll talk about these types of socialism, and then in the second video, I'll, I'll start to look at our key thinker, um, kind of Karl Marx. Now, if you remember, uh, liberalism, two types. Modern, classic. Conservatism, three types. Uh, you, you should know what they are. And socialism, we've actually kind of got four. And if you remember in conservatism... You, you get the new right and you get traditional conservatism and they're so different that you can almost look at them and go, how did those two, how are these both called conservatism when the principles behind them are so different on human nature and the economy and so on? Now, socialism does a similar trick, but instead of doing it in a big jump, it does it slowly. And if I just bring up all three of the, four of these bubbles for a minute, if you were to look at revolutionary socialism and the third way, and don't worry, don't worry about what they are for a minute, you would look at them and go, oh my goodness, how on earth are these both socialism? How on earth did you get from these views of Karl Marx where you have revolution and you're abolishing capitalism to the third way where basically you've got um, a liberal economy? But what socialism does is it slowly evolves through four different types and each time it evolves, it becomes a little less revolutionary, it becomes a little bit more moderate, if I'm allowed to use that word, until you end up with something that looks an awful lot like modern um, um, liberalism. So if you were to put, say, Karl Marx and Anthony Giddens, or to, for simplistic, simplicity's sake, if you were to put um, Karl Marx and Tony Blair in a room together, they wouldn't necessarily find a lot in common. But if you were to line up all of our key thinkers in a row, you could see the slow, slow changes taking place in order for this chain of socialism to get from Karl Marx um, to Tony Blair. So what are these four types that we're going to be learning about? This is our kind of little overview to the types of um, socialism. We start off 
with what's known as revolutionary socialism. These are the socialists that believe we must literally revolt, we must overthrow the capitalist masters and, and the factory owners by force in a revolution that is likely to be violent and bloody. And capitalism as it's at it, at it as a whole is wrong, it is immoral, it will lead to exploitation, it is wrecking human nature, it must go and it must be replaced by a system of public ownership. It is, by modern standards, it feels extreme. Remember the context in which it was written and you can see why those thinkers believed that this was the way that it had to be. Slowly, and by the time we get to our third key thinker, we have moved to what's called democratic socialism, which is the idea that we will get to socialism. We will abolish capitalism. We will um, rewire the economy, etc., etc. But rather than doing it through revolution, revolutionary socialism, we will do it through democratic means. So we are still going to end up with socialism, but we're going to do it through elections. And this is where you get the beginning of the Labour Party um, through our thinker here, who is a lady, a lady known as, as Webb, or surnamed Webb. And so this time we, we've kind of removed that bloody revol revolutionary angle, but we're still, we've still got the same goals. We've still got the same goals. Over time, it evolves further. And now the socialists start to say, well, actually, there are some benefits to capitalism. And also by this point, and here we are now, maybe now the 1950s, the 1960s, the 1970s, we're, the factories are no longer quite as exploitative. We've had lots of laws and um, changes to how the upper classes can treat the lower classes or the bourgeoisie can treat the proletariat, if I've got that around the right way. Um, and you've got... A capitalism now which is a bit more tame, a bit less harsh. And so now socialists start to kind of think, well, hang on a minute. Maybe we don't need to fully abolish capitalism. We just need to rein it in. Rein it in and then combine it. And so now we end up with something called social democracy. Now, one of the things students often get confused about is they kind of go, hang on a minute, democratic socialism, social democracy... Those are the same two words. They've just been flipped around the other way. It's like the red lorry or the lorry red. It's the same thing. Well, not quite. Because if you look at the second word, the first word is describing the second. Democratic socialism. This is socialism. But the second one, it's social democracy. This is democracy. Okay, there is a difference. It's the second word which tells you how it has actually changed. And under social democracy, you start to see something rather similar, familiar to what we've actually looked at in some of the con uh, conservative, um, in, in the kind of the one nation conservative and modern liberal view. We get Keynes Keynesian style economics or Keynesian style economics or Keynesian style economics. There seems to be a million different pronunciations of it. And a mixed economy with a mixture of private and publicly owned um, goods. This is a huge difference from revolutionary socialism because A, we are accepting capitalism. B, we are combining capitalism with socialist ideas. Um, and thirdly, of course, this is all now taking place through a ballot box, a, a voting system, rather than in any other way. And and then we end up to end up with what's called third way socialism, which is like your new Labour, Tony Blair, Bill Clinton style of conservatism, which completely accepts the 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 fact that a capitalist style economy has been embedded, hence a liberal economy, a free market, and instead argues for equality of opportunity, social justice, the ability to make sure that people are treated well. You've got kind of fundamental um, kind of equality. Um, and you end up with something that looks suspiciously like modern liberalism with a few tweaks to the idea of collectivism versus um, in individualism. But we'll explore the third way more um, in, in those videos. So I hope this gives this video has given you an idea to the, the core values of socialism. I hope it, it ha you have understood why it exists. And I also hope now you can kind of see the different types and you're starting to understand how socialism through time over kind of like 200 years of, of social and industrial and legal change, socialist ideas change to respond to um, what is kind of taking 
place. Thank you for watching. If you like the video, then please give it a like. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, then please do. And in the next video, we'll be directly looking at um, Karl Marx and some of his ideas and exploring the ideas here of revolutionary socialism. Socialism. There you go. I said it. Take care. Bye-bye.